for our critic Miriam Thaggart, um, the process of racialization implies the performance of race, right? That race as a uh, race as a category, as a as an incoherent set of norms, is itself something that is performed, right? Um, and in passing, in the pages of passing, this performance occurs in concert with um, matters of fashion and of etiquette. The presumed and shared visibility of race and fashion for Thaggart is central uh, to her argument about the way in which one can use um, the latter, that is fashion, um, subversively, subversively, in order to disrupt and to trespass the former, that is, the ties of race. On page 510 to 511, uh, she writes, let me try to find those pages, hopefully, hopefully they are um, parts that I want to read. Okay. Okay, so beginning at the paragraph, sorry, that long pause, paragraph begins, Foucault's reading, we'll return to Foucault in the last video. Foucault's reading and writing metaphor in the passage uh, that Thaggart quotes above suggests not only the visual appraisal of surface, readily apparent bodily attributes, but also the process of making meaning and forming knowledge out of those physical cl clues, a process inherent in the Rhinelander trial which we'll come back to in the histor historicism lectures, and a strategy Larson's characters employ. Passing, the novel, undermines the grammar of racial language, communicated through and by the body, those signs of intelligibility that help to enable meaning. Both the novel and the trial, the Rhinelander case, center on the assumption of an always decipherable, easily readable black body, the novel disrupts a racial and sexual legibility, the meanings derived from stereotypes, by simultaneously hindering the reader's act of interpreting Claire and making the reader question the interpretive practices of Irene, just as the jury in the Rhinelander trial must decide to which racial category Alice belongs and judge, Leonard, and judge Leonard's ability to read his wife. Reading the woman's body in both the novel and the trial is a delicate act because of the uncertainty of race, of the light-skinned body. In passing, this uncertainty is further heightened by the potential for ambiguity of the decorated, stylized female form, the masquerade and remaking of the self available through fashion and cosmetics. Indeed, as Larson presents them, race, racial passing and fashion are curiously related. There is an easy confluence between the two because of their reliance on the subtleties of vision. Depending on the appearance of the mixed race female body, the subject who passes can elide categories determined by race, and clothes can camouflage the body for those special times when, quote, she's quoting the critic here, we don't want to be seen, or when we don't want our true selves to show through, end quote. Irene's and Claire's performance of a certain type of femininity, with fashion as their costumes and middle-class etiquette as their stage directions, helps the women to accentuate the ambiguous visual demarcations of the African-American light-skinned body and enables them to pass as white more successfully. Fashion and passing are forms of reinventing the self in the novel, ways to restylize how the black or the black-white female body can be read, or indeed, ways to deny any reading at all. As Meredith Goldsmith's article suggests, another critic on Larson, Larson's heroines revel in the, quote, pleasures of bodily self-fashioning, end quote. This essay differs from hers, meaning uh, Thaggart saying her argument differs from Goldsmith's, by highlighting the adornment of the body not only to show the character's, quote, attempt at identity construction, end quote, but also to reveal how the characters strategically confuse the spectator of the black female body. Um, I, I was originally going to keep reading, but I think I will um, stop there for now. Drawing, uh, as she explains in the next paragraph and on other pages, 
from the gender theory of Judith Butler, who also has a has a has an essay in this volume. Thaker develops a complex argument concerning how the adoption and subversion of certain codes of conduct, fashion, and etiquette end up reshaping race in the novel as indecipherable, right? As something that needs to be, according to the cultural, easily and visibly decipherable to something indecipherable, since it is not so easily corroborated. Moreover, Claire Kendry herself, as the central mystery of the novel, becomes an insolvable, insolvable and unsolvable, I think I'm an insoluble but unsolvable reading problem in the novel, right? And in fact, the novel sets it up that she, there is no answer, real answers to any of the questions we may have about her. The partial perspectives of uh, Claire that we get in the novel from Irene, um, whose, uh, whose eyes are always drawn to Claire's body, to her fashion, to her gestures, to her movements, is never enough to offer us a complete picture, right? A complete picture of Claire, of her life, of how she died, of whether or not she was actually having an affair with Brian, or even what race itself is. Um, I thought before I end this video, which is probably gonna run a little short, I would look at some later um, pages in the novel. Um, If you want some examples of where um, where there is this confluence of fashion and race, I mean, really, just look at any page <laughs> where Claire um, Claire shows up, right? And you and you can see in the way in which Irene looks at her and reads her body this um, relationship always um, at work. Okay, but uh, returning just to the issue of how Irene herself is always worrying over and problematizing race. I want to point you to 69. Um, she's, at this point, thinks that her husband and Claire are having an affair, and she's trying to think about ways to get rid of her, and it, the idea pops into her mind that, but if Bellew only knew, right, who Claire was. So 69, she drew a quick, sharp breath, and for a long time sat staring down at the hands in her lap. Strange, she had not before realized how easily she could put Claire out of her life. She had only to tell John Bellew that his wife... No, not that. But if she should somehow learn, he should somehow learn of these Harlem visits, why should she hesitate? Why spare Claire? But she shrank away from the idea of telling that man, Claire Kendry's white husband, anything that would lead him to suspect that his wife was a Negro. Nor could she write it or telephone it or tell it to someone else who would tell him. She was caught between two allegiances, different yet the same, herself, her race. Different yet the same. That's a sentence worth interpreting. Race, the thing that bound and suffocated her. This is an important lens through which to read those early pages on race. Whatever step she took, or if she took none at all, something would be crushed, a person or the race. Claire, herself, or the race. It might be, or it might be, all three. Nothing, she imagined, was ever more completely sardonic. Sitting alone in the quiet living room, in the pleasant firelight, Irene Redfield wished for the first time in her life that she had not been born a Negro. For the first time in her life, she suffered and rebelled because she was unable to disregard the burden of race. It was, she cried silently, enough to suffer as a woman, an individual, on one's own account, without having to suffer for the race as well. It was a brutality undeserved. Surely no other people so cursed as Ham's um, children, dark children. Nevertheless, her weakness, her shrinking, her own inability to compass the thing did not prevent her from wishing fervently that in some way with which she had no concern, John Bellew would discover not that his wife had a touch of the tar brush, Irene didn't want that, but that she was spending all the time that he was out of the city in Black Harlem. Only that, it would be enough to rid her forever of Claire Kendry. On the next page, she runs into um, John on the street with her friend Feliz. Um, except she doesn't, she doesn't tell him. Bottom of 70, Irene was thinking, I had my chance and didn't take it. I had only to speak and to introduce him to Feliz with a casual remark that he was Claire's husband. Only that, fool, fool, that instinctive loyalty 
to a race. Why couldn't she get free of it? Why should it include Claire? Claire, who'd shown little enough consideration for her and hers. What she felt was not so much resentment as a dull despair, because she could not change herself in this respect, could not separate individuals from the race, herself from Claire Kendry. So, um, there was a little jump cut there. Uh, I read those uh, passages uh, and from near the end of Passing in order to help show how the, the problem of race is not just a problem with its uh, inequalities and injustice, but a problem with how it actually works and how, when even understood as a construct, it nevertheless operates. Um, to form affinities and alliances and to form groups that nevertheless one may or may not have a great deal of concern and concern for and duty to. Um, and so the sorts of obligations that crop up um, are no less real, even if they're in concert with these constructed categories like race or like gender or like sex or age or, or what have you. <clears throat> um, it is important, continuing with my written remarks, I'm almost done with them, it is important to point out that all three articles that we read on Nella Larson's passing, two of which uh, you read for the final class, approach the issue of race differently. So as to go about, so, um, so as you, excuse me, so as you go about writing your own papers for your final portfolio, and, um, and you, if you feel uh, that you'd like to take a, a race studies perspective or approach to passing, you may want to ask yourself how the author unpacks race as a category and how the authors of the articles unpack race. It might also be worthwhile looking at the historical material I assigned um, and that which we didn't assign <laughs> and that which, excuse me, I didn't assign, um, although uh, we didn't really have much time to discuss it in class anyway. What assumptions does this material make about race? How might the novel offer a complex, disturbing, and rich response to those assumptions? How might it serve as a critique, the novel that is, not only of the racism we observe in a character like John Bellow, who is so easily unlikable, but of the very system upon which Irene and her family rely for their social position? The very system that Claire has mastered in her own movements and tress passings. The issue of this historical material to which I just alluded brings me now to the next critical approach of the semester, New Historicism. <laughs>